wind blowing, snowing, wind's doing 100 miles an hour, whatever, it's still a good day to serve the Lord. Amen. So I'm thankful for what God has done. You know, um, I, I just want to have a simple something you've all heard, something you should all know and already believe. But I want to talk about New Testament salvation, what we ought to believe and what we ought to know. And, and the thing, and just remind ourselves again that what we know is true. And then remind ourselves again that, that God saved us and that He has a very purpose to use us to save others today. So, you know, we had the privilege yesterday of going to a wedding in Mitchell in a denominal church and one that is steeped in tradition and set through a very much traditional wedding, I guess, and, and uh, a mass to go with it, and, and a place was packed, and it was full, and, uh, and, and not a question in anybody in any of these minds in that whole place uh, about whether this was right or this was wrong or, or how this applied in Scripture at all. But, you know, the subject of salvation ought to be of interest to everybody. It ought to be of interest to people who, uh, that know the Lord, as, as we saw in that wedding that we were at yesterday and those that, that say they have a love for God. But how is it based upon a scripture? And that's where we want to talk about here this morning today. So, that you know, there's a lot of scriptural things. There's a lot about the Word of God that people don't know and a lot of stuff in the Word of God that people don't believe. And so we want to talk, you know, the, the Spirit of God, it's come into this world to lead us into all truth. It's come to lead us and, and guide us to truth, but it's hard for people to receive the truth. And, and, and as I sat in this atmosphere um, yesterday, it, it would be hard for people to receive the message of this salvation, of this gospel, because they've already have this experience, this Christian experience that they call it. They're already, this, this was grandma's religion, this was grandpa's religion, this was mom's, and, and this is how I was raised up. And if you ever uh, try to witness and have conversation with somebody like that, well, they'll, they'll put out uh, the fact that, well, I'm this. Or I'm this religion, or I'm that religion. And, and somehow along the whole conversation, that's supposed to put, put you at ease. That's supposed to put you at rest. And In other words, you're supposed to quit talking to them about your salvation because I'm this. And, and, and they put their trust in, in what grandpa had. And they put their trust in what grandma had. And they put their trust in, in all of that tradition and all of those dogmas and creeds and everything that they uh, have been raised up in. And, the, they, and that's where they'll put their foundation in it. And, and in the conversation of trying to witness to them, they'll throw out this fact that I'm, I'm, a, I'm this religion or I'm that religion and that's supposed to be the end all to your conversation to them. And so it's incumbent upon us that we be filled with the Holy Ghost and we begin to be able and know how to persuade and know how to talk to them and be able to tell them, well, what, what does the Scripture have to say? And what does the Bible tell us that we ought to know? And so it's tough sometimes to... Um, a lot of people are... are are afraid of the conversation, maybe. I don't know how else to put it. They're afraid of anything that's not taught in their particular denomination or anything that's... Um, and, and they'll go so far as to label it maybe as hearsay or go so far as to label it maybe as false teaching or, or, or God forbid, it should be fanaticism or, or you're, you're, you're too... You don't have to be like that, or you're too wound up, too tight, or, or it's, you know, charismatic, or however they want to do it, fanaticism. But rather than stop and allow us, let's get into the Word of God, and let's see what happened in Scripture. Let's see what it says in the Word of God. But you know, if it's not taught in their denomination, or not taught in their place, then, then they'll quickly throw a label out at it. It's fanaticism or it's hearsay or whatever. But look what Paul said in, in Acts chapter 24 verse 14. And he said, but this I confess unto thee that after the way which they call hearsay, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. What Paul was pretty zealous about what he believed. And he, and he went about persecuting those that believed in Jesus. He went about persecuting all those. So he... Uh, 
he imprisoned them, he killed them. Uh, but after Jesus appeared unto him and, and spoke to him, something happened in Paul's life and he was transformed. So after the way which they call hearsay. So we need not to be concerned about whether somebody thinks it's hearsay or they think it's fanaticism or they think it's totally unnecessary or, or any of those things. What does the Bible have to say about salvation? What does it have to say about us? So if, what, what would happen if we were to compare just a, just a big broad brush and, and a great big tapestry and compare the religions of today with what the apostles had and what was in the New Testament church and what was in the book of Acts, just a big broad brush. You know what? They, they baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus. I'm just a big broad brush of all, all of Christianity throughout all of our country, throughout all of the world. How does it compare to what happened in the New Testament church? They baptized all of their converts by immersion in Jesus' name. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues. Read in the book of Acts. It's, this is the establishment of the early church. They, they baptized in Jesus' name. They were expected to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost by speaking in other tongues. And they believed and practiced and it followed them divine healings and deliverances. And God opened prison doors and, and, and the Spirit of God led them and directed them, guided them to places where they need to be and people who were hungry. We were to compare the religion of today with what the apostles had. And I, and, and I don't just throw that out on a broad brush to every denominal church. But what about in this church? We baptize in Jesus' name. We believe in being filled with the Holy Ghost. We have evidence of all that. But we need to follow further on and see the people healed in Jesus' name. And, and further on and see the prison bars open. I haven't been put in prison for my faith. I haven't been cast out and I haven't been ridiculed for my faith. I've been mocked a time or two, but I haven't gone so far as to be in jail. And they sang when they were in jail, beaten. I haven't been beaten. I haven't been thrown out into the street and left for dead. How do we compare our belief in, in, in them? So it's, you know, how, how then is it called? It's, it, a lot of it's called so much fanaticism or hearsay or whatever you want to call it. But in, in uh, I'll just tell you, it's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The church hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. He's the same. There's no other God. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism in Jesus' name. And it's all, it's not changed. And so the church, of course, we're affected by our culture. And of course, we're affected by the season and the time that we live in is, is different than it was in the apostles' days. But the power of God is no different. And the move of the Holy Ghost is no different. And the opportunities that we have to see people's lives, people aren't different. Spirits don't die. People aren't different. We're still battling the same spirits that they battled. They, they had a battle against spirits that, that they offered their children into the fire. Well, we know what happens to unborn children. There's the same spirits. They don't die. We're still battling the same battles. We're still battling the same spiritual battles that they battled in those days. And we need to have an understanding today that it's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and it's not changed. So many people have inherited their religious beliefs from their parents, from their moms, from their dad. And, and they never really take the time to stop and compare their beliefs to the Bible. Matthew called it blind leaders of the blind. And, the, and, and I'm... I, you know, how can people that have never been born again, and I, please, I'm not trying to put ourselves up on this pedestal or put anybody down it in any, any fashion. That's not the point here today. But how can they who have never experienced the new birth and how that have never been baptized in Jesus' name, never been filled with the Holy Ghost and, and that conversion experience, how can they properly then interpret the Bible and properly then teach? And God has been moved on my heart here, just, uh, and I'm, I'm detouring from, from the script here a little bit, but I, of late and, and possibly for the last year or so have, have been moved in my heart that there are 
men of God pastoring churches, faithful men of God, families pastoring churches with, with a, a genuine calling from God. I don't doubt at all. Young man, uh, teenage year, called of God and, and gone through the proper training in, in, in what they believe and, and established in a church someplace and, and had a genuine move of God in their lives and felt a real calling from God, the pastor, or to, and, and now have are in a place where they've been diligent, have been faithful, have gone, but it's now come to a place where that time of the calling was maybe a decade ago. Or the time of that calling, that burden that God placed on their heart was two, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But they've been faithful men of God, pastoring in places and pastoring and serving and, and marrying and burying. And, and, and every Sunday having a message. And, and you understand they've been diligent men of God, pastoring denominal churches with a burden that God gave them. But somewhere along the way, tradition has preempted Somewhere along the way, um, the duty has become duty. The obligation has become obligation. And then now we're leaning upon an experience that was 20 years ago. Leaning upon a calling. But there's faithful men of God, good people, great people. You, you come against them and, and, and they're moral and they're clean and they're good, honest people. But they're laboring in a burden that the calling was 20 years ago. And laboring in something that God never, they never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So they're leaning upon men's understanding. They're lean, maybe they're, they're getting their sermon sent to them in a, or in a quarterly, however it's done. But these are faithful men of God ministering in places uh, and marrying and burying. But I, I, and God, I feel impressed on my heart that God has said that these men are, are hungry for truth. Hungry for that time when they were in Bible college, that they had uh, prayer meetings that kept them up all night and tears and the, and the joy that they had in, in serving God and the joy that called them into the ministry in the first place. And that joy has gone to a place of duty and obligation and now they're ministering in a place where they're watching the congregation of their church. Uh, they're marrying but they're seeing divorce. They're watching in the congregation of their church how that they become more like the world and they seem powerless to stop the onslaught of the world that's taking place in their churches. And, and they're seeing the, 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 the tattoos or seeing the piercings or seeing families split up or seeing things happen in their churches and, they're, and, and they seem powerless to be able to stop the onslaught of the world and, and powerless to... And watching as their congregations get more and more like the world... And, and, and powerless seemingly to stop it and burdened in their hearts for their churches and burdened in their hearts for their own families and burdened for the things that God put a burden on their heart for but they're laboring in a place that's duty now and it's obligation and there's no power in it anymore and, and seem hopeless to be able to stop the onslaught. And I'm deterring a long ways from what I wanted to talk about today. But I'm telling you today that there are people that are hungry, but they're not going to set foot in this church. Because they're having their own service. They're faithful to their congregations. They're faithful to the ministry that they've been called to do. And they're not going to come here. And, and the power of God, I, I, I live to come to church. It's, this, is, this is it, the highlight. The first day of the week is this is the highlight of my week. I would be nowhere else. If you cut off one of my legs, I'll come in on one leg. I mean, that's just that's the joy of our lives is to be a part of a church and part of a family and, an ob and, and the people that love God. But there are men and women of God that are laboring in, in their burdens that aren't going to put their feet in the congregation. They're not going to set foot in this building. But they're still hungry. They're still thirsting. They're still struggling with the, with the congregations and how to stop the onslaught of the world that takes over their churches and takes over the things that are happening in their congregations and powerless to it. It's so important that we be led by the Holy Ghost to reach these people. And, and, and you'll see they went from house to house in the book of Acts. They went from place to house to house to house. They didn't establish this big church and draw, draw them all into the church. 
But we need to be sensitive in the power of the Holy Ghost and sensitive in what God has given us to reach the lost and realize that, that it might be the pastor on the church right down the street that's crying every night wondering, God, what am I going to do? This church, I love my people. I love the church, but there, I'm watching my church fall apart. I'm watching the onslaught of the world take over my congregation and seem powerless to be able to stop it. But there's a, I'm not question or call, a genuine calling from God, but there are now ministering in duty and obligation and bound by it and we've got to be able to reach them outside of the walls of this place because they won't be here because there's service at 10 o'clock where they're at there's service at 11 o'clock where they're at and and then we need to be able to reach them and find them and it's going to have to be on a monday night it's going to have to be on a tuesday night it's going to have to be when they're not doing anything else and then the youth leaders in these churches are watching the young people just kind of grow more and more worldly and more and more uh, with, with whatever it is that the world is. What's the next fad? What's the next fashion? What's the next thing that the world offers? And I detoured a long ways from what I wanted to talk about. But I'm telling you, God has got a church in this city and there are other men of God that are hungry for truth. And, and, and that's why I'm so thrilled by Next Town Ministries. is because that is an outreach beyond the walls of this church. An outreach beyond the, the, the city limits of this place. And we're reaching out into places where there's people that are hungry. That won't set foot in this place, but we're going there. We won't set foot here, but we're going to go meet them where they're at. And we're going to be able to cross paths with them and, and go reach out for them. It's so important then. And, wow. I'll, maybe I'll get back to it. Maybe I won't. But I know 17 years ago, y'all came here. In, in, is it next month, 17 years? Doug was the only one in a small church on the other side of town. Doug Fuller and Mark and Jordan Brown. And did you sit in the church and wait for people to come to you? <laughs> I think not. Remember passing out bread, Troy? You remember going and knocking on people's doors? You remember meeting them and talking to them? You remember at work how, how you went early in the morning to work at Starbucks? But how many people did you meet there that, that you were friendly to, that, that you, you just had an influence? And you told them why you were here in town, and you told them what you were doing and what you were starting. But you didn't just sit in, in, the, in the church and have church on Sunday and see who's going to show up. You were proactive, you reached out, you were proactive, you sought them out, you went to them, you, you did whatever you could do to have, have an influence, you did whatever you could do to be able to cross paths with somebody, you did whatever you could do to try to get the name of the church and try to get the fact that there's a God that wants to save your soul. And you went to the, to the um, Boys and Girls Club, you went to the prison, you went to the jailhouse, you went places. You understand that that's exactly the, the apostolic church in the book of Acts. They didn't just get themselves a building and sit and see who God's going to bring in today. But they were proactive and that was the outreach that they had. I wonder how it would be if they were sitting in that little church waiting for people to show up. And wondering why. Why then? But you know they came here with a burden from God. And came here with a calling from God. And, and put that calling in, in their shoes. And put that calling in their feet. And began to knock on a door. And began to pass out bread. And began to do whatever they could do to get the name of Jesus church. Out into the city and out into the place where people would recognize it. And church the calling hasn't changed. There's a whole lot. Actually we ought to be a little better off. Because there was three of them. And in Troy, there was four of them. And they turned the city upside down. And now we're looking at a hundred of us. And we ought to be able to turn the city upside down. It's now multiplied by 25 times the number of people that are here. And the outreach needs to be 25 times bigger than it was when they got here. And, and I, I'm, I'm talking to myself here today. I'm, uh, God has been speaking into me today. There's people that are hungry for this truth, that are burdened in the direction of their ministries, are burdened in the conditions of their churches, and burdened in the fact that there, there's just something more from God. 
And we've got to be able to reach them. And we've got to know what we believe. And we've got to understand. And, and, and understand yesterday we were in a place with a whole... I think if I would have stood up in the front of 200 people and began to talk to them about salvation, they would have all almost uniformly come back with the phrase that, well, we're... This is what we are. And that's probably intended to shut you down. Intended to stop you. But you know what? Jesus' death purchased a far greater salvation than people know of today. It purchased a far greater thing than, than people are willing to accept today. And people are... We're, and it, it was difficult yesterday. I struggled with it. We had a wedding and then we had a... Um, what do they even call it? A, a dance, but they had a, a, a reception afterwards but, uh, and a meal, but there was a, a happy hour. I don't know what they call it. A social hour. And so now you... Anyway, then these are all the people that are telling you that, you know, we believe in God, but we had our social hour and we had our meal and, 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 and we left. We were awful. We ate and ran. But I know where it was going after that. And we really didn't need to be there any longer today. But God has so much more for, for what people understand. He has, if they understood how, what God had in store for them. And they understood how good God is. And the life he would be able to give them. Uh, and how are they going to know? And, and how are they going to even know? It's, it's, it's like it says in, in, in Romans. Oh the depth and the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That, that God desires to give every one of us righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And and Holy Ghost, the receiving of the Holy Ghost that is is definitely the highlight. It ought to be you ought to be able to look back to the day you received the Holy Ghost. Look back to the day you were baptized. There, there's hallmarks. I, of course, you, I, I would hope you remember the day you were born. Not that you don't remember the day, but you know the date. <laughs> I'll get it. I'm glad I don't know the day. Remember. <laughs> that would be terrible. But I go around this room. Every one of you tell me your birthday. <laughs> oh, yeah. But everybody knows your birthday. And some of you husbands better be able to tell me really quick what your anniversary is and the dates of your children's birthdays. There's highlights. We have highlights in our lives. We have places in our lives that are, that are hallmarks that we remember. And, and anybody tell me the day that you got baptized in Jesus' name, you remember that? And anybody remember the day God poured out His Spirit upon you and gave you the Holy Ghost? There's highlights. And if people in this world would know what happened in their lives and, and know what God has in store, there'd be a, a, a check mark on the calendar that says on this day in 1981, I got, the, I got baptized in Jesus' name. And this day, amen, I, got, I received the Holy Ghost. And I, uh, to, for me, I can't tell you what day I got baptized. <laughs> I can't tell you what day I got the Holy Ghost. I can tell you the day that I came back to God and turned around and my life became different. But it was a few weeks or, or a couple of months after that that I said, I need... I, after the teaching of the word, I realized I needed to be baptized, and I got baptized. I don't know the date, and I'd already received the Holy Ghost at home at, on the cop on, on the dining or a uh, couch. I don't know what day of the week it was. I had to go ask somebody what happened, but God poured out His Spirit, and I know that it happened. I can more, I can still picture in my mind the day that it happened and, and where it happened, and and I still remember being baptized in Jesus' name. I, I, I wish I could remember the dates, but I don't. But there's highlights in our lives. And if people would be able to understand and, and know, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how blessed, how, how would they be knocking the doors down if they knew what we had? Knocking the doors down if they had the joy of the Holy Ghost like we have. You know, Peter... There's a Holy Ghost, a supernatural evidence. Peter and the Jews understood and perceived that the household of Cornelius had received the Holy Ghost. How did they know that? Because they heard him speak with other tongues. And we should 
like in the book of Acts, expect the same evidence today. That same evidence exists today. And people in this world will mistakenly believe that they have received the Holy Ghost when they haven't. And because they are told, because when they start to believe, or they make a, a, a confession of a faith and say that that's when they received the Holy Ghost because they had a confession of faith. There, is it any wonder then that, that some of the churches are so dead and so dry and, and, and the unreality of, of, of living a, a Christian life, the unreality of, of having the authority over sin and, and, and the joy of the Holy Ghost and, and the onslaught of the world is not there to tear, tear everything down. But when they are told that by your confession of your faith you've now received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and, and that, but there's no power. The scripture says you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and then, so then, just a mere profession of Christian faith. Is it any wonder, when, any wonder at all? why the onslaught of the world is so strong in these places and why men are laboring in, in a ministries that they seem powerless to overcome. But I know on the day of Pentecost, the, the New Testament church, when it was inaugurated in the book of Acts, they all spoke with tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. They all spoke with tongues. And this is that when Peter spoke to them. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. That was prophesied. And if God did it that way for the apostles, how then will people today say, and, and, and maybe you haven't heard it, but I've heard it, but this is not for today. This is the work, and, and so far as to even say this is the work of the devil. But it's not for today, that was for the apostles. Well, honey, you came a little late. I'm speaking in tongues today, this morning, five o'clock this morning, praying in the Holy Ghost. So, you know, if it's the work of the devil, then give me some more. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> but you know what? It's just because there's no understanding. Never receive the Holy Ghost. Don't look into the Word of God. Or, or haven't opened the Bible in, in years, probably, and they'll go by what somebody wants to tell them. And, and, well, my pastor says, well, what does it say? Read it for yourself. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's just like when Saul was stopped on the road to Damascus. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to change from, from what he understood. And he was zealous of what he understood and zealous for what he knew. But Peter preached this a sermon on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Ghost pricked the hearts of the hearers and with conviction they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And I'm convinced today that, that uh, those of us with the Holy Ghost and those of us with a calling from God upon our lives, and, and I mean all of us, with a calling to share this gospel, that when we begin to speak it, it ought to prick the hearts of those that hear it. It ought to stir up some conviction in somebody's life and they ought to be able to cry out and say, what shall we do? when they hear this message and, and it's going to have to be a message that you believe in not just something somebody told you but when you're convinced I'm not just parroting the words of my pastor I'm not just parroting the words of, uh, of somebody else but what I'm telling them is an experience that I've had what I'm telling them is you know I'm not at the mercy of some maybe I don't know the scriptures as well as that man that's been pastoring his church for 30 years but I do know have an experience and I'm not at the mercy of a man with an argument if I have an experience I've been filled with the Holy Ghost and you might be able to twist me around and and and, and shame on on me if you can but twist me around in scriptures and try to prove some other different way but it's too late to tell me I don't have the Holy Ghost and I have an experience of deliverance from sin and I have an experience of, of, of walking in the holiness and I have an experience of separation to God and I have an experience that you can't talk me out of and that's where Paul came in and said I was on the road to Damascus. He had an experience that he was able to share throughout the book of Acts and that experience that we have ought to be able to make a difference where we go. 
I have an experience. I have an understanding. And we need to learn and we need to understand the scriptures. But Peter on that day, or, or I'm sorry, Peter on the day of Pentecost told them when they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He gave them an answer Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But how that method has been kind of misconstrued and twisted in today. And, and, and churches, they'll take a, and turn it around and, and they'll call it, they'll go into the book of Matthew, or Matthew and say that they're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, we can scripturally prove the name of the Father. We can scripturally pr prove the name of, the, uh, of Jesus is the Son. And the Holy Ghost, I have come in my Father's name. So it's been twisted. And so it's no wonder that churches don't have the results that the church had in the book of Acts. Uh, the experience, it says it in, in uh, Ephesians, that the experience must be built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And Paul declared, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel... Unto you then which we've preached, let them be accursed. So there's a measure of truth in most churches. The name of Jesus. And, and understand how, how then if, if there's not a belief in the, in the oneness of God and not a belief in, the, in baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, how then are people healed? And how then are people delivered? And, there, and I'm not, there, there is miraculous deliverances by a, a repentance experience. And I can tell you by experience that a repentance experience is a tremendous touch from God in a person's life. And there are people that are walking for a long time and generational and decades long on a repentance experience. And, and there's people that are healed outside of this. Our, we, we have no uh, exclusive right to the healing of God. And where there is the name of Jesus and where there is faith, God will heal. Where there's the name of Jesus, where there's faith, God will allow you to walk in a repentance experience that will keep you, that will hold you. But there's so much more. There's so much more in the Holy Ghost. There's so much more that God wants to do. But I make no light and I, I don't shortchange anybody's repentance experience or anybody's healing. God will heal when the name of Jesus is there. And God will heal when there's faith. And God will keep you in a repentance experience. But one why not have so much more? Why not have uh, more in our lives? The deeper truths of salvation, a lot of they say are so unnecessary. The speaking in other tongues or hearsay or whatever they want to call it. But they're only for the apostles. But God is not a respecter of persons. God will save whosoever he will. And he'll do for us and he'll do for this generation whatever he did in the apostles' day. It's in the book. I believe it. It's in the book. I, I, I want it for me today. And so there's repentance. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name and the Holy Ghost. We gotta repent of our sins. We've got to turn away from our sins. And I have no idea. It's ten. Okay, I didn't see the clock. I don't want to go on too long. But we've got to repent. We've got to turn away from our sins and turn to God. Repentance is motivated by a godly sorrow, not just sorry for. And, and oftentimes we run into people that it seems like a repentance, but really all it is is sorrowing for my circumstance. And to come to God because my marriage has fallen apart or come to God because I've been drunken now for four years and, and, and can barely count a day when I haven't been. There's a lot of repentance experiences that are that, that come in, in with a sorrowing, but it's not a sorrow it's a sorrow I'm sorry for where my life is at I'm sorry for the circumstances of my life I'm sorry that my family's fallen apart I'm sorry for whatever it is that that breaks your heart but it needs to be a godly sorrow it needs to be in the in when we come in repentance it needs there, there needs to be a confession of our sins to God and a turning away I change my mind I don't want to be a drunk anymore I'm going to do whatever it takes to make my life pleasing to God that, that's the repentance experience and, and, and I can tell you there is power in a repentance experience a godly repentance a godly sorrowing for sins a godly turning away from, from the sins of our 
our lives. There's power in that. But in, in that repentance, we, it needs to be followed up with a baptism in Jesus' name by immersion. It needs to be followed up by the fact that Jesus told his disciples in, in the book of Matthew, he said, Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and then the Holy Ghost. He didn't say to baptize them in the titles. He gave them the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But it, it would, if that was how we baptize, it would be a contradiction contradiction in the Bible because they baptized in Jesus name in the book of Acts and we can take the time to show you that the very fact that he said baptize them in the name a singular name he, and, and, and you've heard this analogy before but if I gave you my checkbook you'd be disappointed anyway but I'd give you my checkbook and, and there it is and you put on their father I'm a father you put on their son I'm a son and then, and then the other thing you write on there is husband or whatever. I'd seriously hope the bank wouldn't honor that check. But if you, put, if you had the name, you put my name on it, you forge my name on it, they, they won't give you nothing. There ain't nothing in there, but... <laughs> We have the authority and the power of the name of Jesus and it's an unlimited blessing and an unlimited bank account, as it were, if we'll call upon the name of Jesus. And so he gave them the authority and gave them the, 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 the power to do so. And, and when they did baptize, they used the name of Jesus. They used that name. He said it didn't contradict what he told them. It didn't contradict a thing. You, and, it, and all throughout the book of Acts, when there was a baptism, it was in the name of Jesus. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. I mean, they baptized in the name of Jesus. The singular name. And, and the titles are not a proper name. And they're just used terms that are used excuse me, to describe God's relationship with us. He's our Father. He's, a, he's our Savior. He's a Spirit that indwells in us. The name of the Son is Jesus. Matthew 1 and 21. Jesus said that He'd come in His Father's name and that the Holy Ghost would be sent in His name in, in John 5 and 43 and also in John 14, 26. The one saving name of God is Jesus, which literally means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah Savior. So Jesus was the one God of the Old Testament who came in flesh to be our Savior. Jesus Christ, from the very foundations of the world, knew that there would be a price to be paid for the sins of man. From the very foundation of the world. When he breathed into man a breath of life, he also knew that one day the breath of life would depart from him. And the sacrifice that would be made for our sins. And yet God desired, he desired your fellowship so much. He desired your love so much. He desired your willing worship and willing love to him so much that when he breathed into them the breath of life, he knew that he would breathe his life, would be, he would breathe his last breath. So there's no other name in, in Acts 4 and 12, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's in the name of Jesus. We baptize in the name of the Jesus. We do all in the name of Jesus. Repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name. And, and so we fulfill Matthew 28, 19 when we baptize in Jesus' name. And God will pour out the Spirit. He'll pour out the Holy Ghost on us just like he did in the disciples in, in, the, in the Bible, he gave the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And there's examples in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues, as he spoke in Mark 16. It takes all three of these, repentance, baptism, infilling of the Holy Ghost, to complete God's plan of salvation in us. And I want to be done here this morning. We need to understand that the world that we live in, I can say that there are people genuinely hungry for the things of God in their lives, but they lack an understanding. And, and, I, and, and I feel it in the Holy Ghost that God has been burdened me to pray for quite some time that there are people that, that cry out to God. And, and it's been impressed upon me that they're 
people with callings on their lives and, and the burdens on their lives. They minister to people and they're burdened by the fact that they seem powerless to stop the onslaught of the world that's coming against their families, coming against their churches. But they're hungry for something from God. And so we need to ask God to help us then. God's going to come, come back soon. And he's going to catch away a people that have the spirit of God in us. The spirit is going to quicken our mortal bodies. The spirit of God is going to lift us up. So we need to examine our own selves and examine who we are and, and see, are we operating in the faith that the apostles had? Are we operating in, in that New Testament salvation? And I'll say that we are, but we need to also to be able to be a witness. I, let's stand today. Thank you for coming this morning. And let's be sensitive today. I, I, I'm convinced there are people that are hungry, but we're not going to meet them here. I'm going to meet them there. And we need to, I, I, we just need to be that kind of sensitive in the Holy Ghost that we are going to meet people that are genuinely hungry, genuinely want to live for God, and you need to be able to teach and show them that, that it's repentance, it's baptism in Jesus' name, it's the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today. You're good. And thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the power of your Spirit upon us today. And God, minister in this house. Teach us your ways today, God, that we walk in them in Jesus' name. Give us, God, a, a right spiritual mind and confidence and assurance that what we know is true and, and that the power of God go before us today and, and the gifts of the Spirit. God, we operate in a, in a spiritual realm in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.